Welcome to the Historical Motion Picture Organization, a podcast in which I interpret ancient historical events as if they were the basis for dramatized HBO style productions. Our first fictional HBO production, The Poison King, will explore the life and times of King Mithridates VI of Pontus in his struggles against the Roman Republic and his attempts to preserve the existence of the waning Hellenistic world. In the previous episode, Mithridates suffered multiple major defeats by Rome, but his surprise moves at the Battle of Zella may have just given his cause a life-saving shot in the arm. In what will be the last podcast of our series about Mithridates, we'll explore how this epic tale concludes, and how we're going to finish our fictional TV show, The Poison King. We're also exploring the final elements of the classical three-act structure, from descending action, to the climax of Act 3, and lastly to the final resolution. Our story is now rapidly approaching Endgame, so let's jump right in and resume where we left off. The Battle of Zella has been a surprising victory for the armies and the cause of Mithridates. His slaughter of the Roman forces there, and his subsequent actions after the battle, seem to herald the beginning of a new dawn. It appears that morning has arrived in Anatolia. The darkness and terror of the Roman night have disappeared, or at least according to our protagonist. In our opening scene, Mithridates assembles his generals and courtiers at the recaptured palace in Sinope. Mithridates tries to organise the feast in celebration, but there is an unspoken hesitancy among those present. Despite the victory at Zella, the war isn't won. There's something rotten lurking just beneath the surface. The situation at Roman command isn't exactly peachy either. Lucullus tries his best to reassemble the battered and disorganised Roman forces in the region, but his men point-blank refuse to take orders from him. Sources state that Lucullus goes from tent to tent, tearfully begging his soldiers to obey, only to be mocked and told to go and fight his enemies alone. What a pitiful scene this would make. But even if his men had been swayed back towards his command, Lucullus' run is coming to an end anyway. The Senate has denounced his actions in the East. They accuse him of prolonging the war against Mithridates in order to increase his own wealth, choosing to plunder and pillage, instead of destroying Mithridates in a set-piece battle. Although we, the viewer, know that that's not true, Lucullus is finished anyway. He's relieved of his command, and his soldiers are disbanded. Lucullus returns to Rome, his command of the war now given to Pompey. Although he's given a public triumph, Lucullus sinks into a depression of overindulgence, topped off with bitter, resentful rancour of having his command stripped from him. Lucullus was a tough opponent for Mithridates. He really ran him ragged, and probably would have succeeded in killing the old king and ending the war for good had his men not thrown in the towel. But his inability to inspire his troops and earn their loyalty cost him everything. Lucullus lives out the rest of his days as a drunken has-been. He doesn't get the glory and the respect he should from his peers and contemporaries, even though he did a lot of work to unravel the grand eastern plans of Mithridates the Great. We discussed Pompey in the previous episode. He's kind of this young, hotshot kid at the moment, He's had a couple of successful commands fighting Rome's enemies in the West, even earning the nickname Teenage Butcher. So he's the new Roman boss in town. We've had a long line of these guys, haven't we? Aquilius, Sulla, Marina, Fimbria, Lucullus. Now this Pompey kid seems certain that he's the man to finish Mithridates forever. There's actually a little story here that I find very funny. It's got a sort of humbling the cocky new guy motif to it and it absolutely has to go into our show. It revolves around an extremely potent honey, known as Mad Honey, found in the wilds of Mithridates' kingdom. Allegedly, as Pompey's armies are marching across the countryside, local partisans leave enticing honeycombs all along the trail. The advanced Roman troops stop to enjoy the treat, and are quickly racked by violent bouts of vomiting and diarrhoea. I can't help but smirk at this story so far. You know, it's kind of waking up the inner child in me that thinks anything to do with shit is funny. 
but it becomes a little more grim when the locals then ambush the weak and disorientated men. Pompey arrives later that afternoon to allegedly find nearly a thousand dead Romans covered in flies, blood and honey. Black, red and yellow. Again, such striking imagery. And any previous hint of humour is washed away with silent horror and rage. Pompey stands among the corpses, hands on his hips, staring in silence. The cocky new guy has been humbled a little bit. This mad honey nonsense won't go unanswered. And despite his initial high after the Battle of Zella, things aren't exactly wonderful for Mithridates either. The Pontic realms have been ravaged by war, famine and pestilence. The population are tired and wary. War with Rome has been dragging on in one form or another for decades. Mithridates is getting older too. He's probably in his mid-sixties by now. He decides to send envoys to Pompey to ask directly, What do you want? Pompey demands unconditional surrender. There's something psychologically unnerving about that demand, isn't there? Whenever I come across it, it strikes me as a very confident power move. It's like your enemy saying, listen, I'm going to destroy you. There's nothing you can do about it. You, you can't bargain with me or reason with me. This ends with your defeat and my victory. There's no deal to be made here, period. It's an emotional sledgehammer to the Mithridatic cause. They wouldn't be putting the feelers out for terms if they were confident of winning. Mithridates and his lieutenants, in one of their last scenes together, discuss what limited options they have. Mithridates mourns for the absence of Doroilus, and of Archelaus, despite his treachery, and of course of his fallen son, Arcathius. Gordius is present, the last member of Mithridates' original inner circle from the coup d'etat that began the whole saga, now almost fifty years in the past. This scene has a twinge of melancholy and nostalgia. They say remember when is the lowest form of conversation. But other than hyped up war talk, it's the only form of conversation the king has left. Mithridates' overall strategic situation isn't good. Pompey has blockaded the entire coast of Asia Minor and convinced the Parthian king, Phraates III, to join the Roman side and invade Armenia. Naturally, This causes Tigranes to pull his armies back to defend his own territory, leaving Mithridates' southern flank across Cappadocia exposed. Pompey promptly rolls in, and as a master of logistics and supply, doesn't succumb to famine and hardship as Mithridates predicts that he will. Every time the Romans send one of these commanders with fresh new armies, they nip a little closer to Mithridates. He doesn't get that kind of rest. He's exhausted. Paranoid and he's been fighting Rome for decades. At first, Mithridates avoids head-on collisions with the legions, electing instead to wage asymmetrical guerrilla-style warfare, all the while banking that the Romans will outrun their supply lines. Mithridates then takes up a position in mountains near the river Lycus, gambling that Pompey's scarcity of provisions will prevent any Roman assault from occurring yet. Adrienne Mayer, in an excerpt from The Poison King, describes Mithridates' last peaceful sleep before his illusions are shattered. Quote, At this place, during a full moon, Mithridates had a dream. It was written down by his soothsayers and discovered by Pompey among his papers after his death. The dream began happily. Mithridates was sailing with a good wind north across the Black Sea, enjoying the salt breeze, his face warmed by the sun's rays. His mood was exuberant. He and his companions on the deck were all conversing pleasantly. The green pastures and terrors of Pantacapaon came into sight. Mithridates felt a glow of supreme confidence, joy and security. He and his Amazon companion, Hypsocratia, would find peace in the kingdom of the Bosphorus on the northern shore of the Black Sea, with the freedom of the vast steppes at their backs. Suddenly, the idyllic dream flipped into a nightmare. Mithridates found himself bereft of all his companions and tossed about in a rough sea, clinging to a bit of wreckage. As the king thrashed about in his sleep, his friends shook him awake. It was the middle of the night, but they were shouting, Pompey is attacking. 
end quote. What a sequence that would make in our HBO show. A perfect little piece of tranquility inside the subconsciousness of Mithridates. A moment of peace before his final defeat at the Battle of the Lycus. In terms of framing and shooting the Battle of the Lycus, I see a lot of tones of blue and black and white in my mind. It's a cold, dark battle near the river. The full moon is a gift to our cinematography department. It allows us to portray a nighttime battle with pretty decent light. Arming himself and charging out of the tent as quickly as possible, Mithridates attempts to lead the defence. Pompey and his officers, however, are using nature itself in their military tactics. The full moon proves to be Pompey's ally, helping him obscure his movements and numbers from the startled defenders. The increasingly elongated shadows, caused by the moon being behind Pompey's men, prevents the Mithridatic forces from correctly estimating the distances between them and their enemies. The Mithridatic archers open up a barrage, but they fall short of hitting the Romans, who are then able to charge the Mithridatic line and engage in their speciality, short-range hand-to-hand combat. Mithridates' forces are butchered, while the Romans take very few losses. Panic quickly spreads and the Pontic forces begin to flee the mountainside in large numbers. Mithridates and a cavalry force cut their way out of an encirclement and the old king manages to escape yet again. That's some amazing imagery, isn't it? Mithridates' archer is so confused by the shadows cast by the moon that they can't even aim properly. Mithridates and a few core followers desperately fighting their way out of an encirclement. And although Pompey has decimated the last major army Mithridates has, he's bitterly disappointed not to be able to count Mithridates among the heaps and heaps of Pontic dead. Mithridates has been defeated in the field for the final time. Mithridates and Hypsocratia, riding with only one other companion, flee into the countryside, hoping to escape the inevitable Roman pursuit. For the sake of dramatic license, I'm going to choose this other companion to be a Gallic soldier named Bacutus, and Bacutus is a bodyguard of Mithridates as well as being a cavalry officer in his armies. The trio of Mithridates, Hypsocratia and Bacutus, now race for the town of Sonora, a fortified treasury on the border of the Kingdom of Armenia. They're joined by the straggling remnants of the army battered senseless under the full moon at the Lycus River. Mithridates hopes to load up with money and treasure and then trek into Armenia to once again find shelter under the protection of his son-in-law Tigranes. But Tigranes, concerned about Roman retaliation and dealing with a Parthian attack on its southern border, now finally cuts ties and refuses to help his old ally. In fact, the old Armenian ruler even puts a bounty on Mithridates' head, perhaps a sort of public statement to Rome that he no longer wishes to be associated with him. Imagine both the emotional and strategic impact this has on Mithridates. I mean, surely this is a huge blow. He's lost his most powerful ally, exposing the eastern flank of Pontus and leaving himself only one other option if he's to escape Pompey's wolves. Mithridates decides to head north to trek through the Caucasus Mountains, the final destination being the Bosphoran Kingdom, still being governed by his son Macaris. It's not exactly an ideal plan, considering the scope and the danger of such a journey, alongside the pursuing Romans and the fact that the Bosphoran kingdom's governor has long since turned against him, when Mithridates has very few choices left. The vast trek begins with Mithridates fleeing north into Colchis, lands within his realm in modern-day southwestern Georgia. He still leads a small army, The loyalty these men gave to Mithridates, even in these bleakest of hours, illustrates the charisma and the leadership he could wield. The old king, even in defeat, still plots and dreams. He aims to retake the Bosphoran kingdom from his turncoat son Macaris, who pledged himself a friend of Rome to Lucullus, while Mithridates fought for his life. He will overthrow the traitor, raise an army from the Scythian tribes, and then do the unthinkable march on Rome itself from beyond the Alps. Sounds like a grand plan, doesn't it? 
in these scenes of shivering soldiers, scaling mountains and slowly starving. The expressions on the faces of Mithridates' surviving entourage read of scepticism and disbelief. Then again, though, the old monarch has time and again come back from the abyss to threaten Rome once more. Why can't it happen again? Pompey's legions are constantly harassed, shadowed by the barbarians that occupy these scary, unknown lands. Warriors referred to as Amazons attack the Roman camp at Armazi, halfway between the Black and Caspian Seas. The Romans respond by burning an entire forest in an attempt to drive the phantom-like Amazons out. But Mithridates is a ghost. He's nowhere to be seen, and soon Pompey tires of the aimless pursuit. The Romans are slogging along in this direction, then turning back around again, then being attacked by this tribe or that band, all the while dealing with snows and mountains, as well as abundant poisonous wildlife like scorpions, tarantulas and snakes. Pompey decides to turn back south. It's a wise choice as he meets much more success there. Tigranes, now nearly 75 years old, is worn out. Tigranes accepts the peace terms offered by Rome. He must pay them 6,000 talents and surrender Mesopotamia, Syria and Phoenicia. In return, hostilities will cease and Tigranes will become a friend of Rome. It might be funny to have the old king parley again with Pulcher, the Roman officer he imperiously dismissed in episode 8. Tigranes the Great will remain a friend of Rome until his death at the age of 85 in 55 BC. Although Mithridates is still alive and on the run somewhere north of the Caucasus Mountains, Pompey declares the war is won. He returns to Pontus and founds the city of Nicopolis, near the site of his moonlit victory at the Lycus. Historians are divided on the exact route that Mithridates and his forces took, but the old king and his men surprise Macaris when they appear outside the capital of the Bosphoran kingdom. It is still a mystery today how Mithridates and his forces survive such a perilous trek, putting themselves through the limits of human endurance by climbing the frozen peaks of the Caucasus Mountains. Our show locale now moves to the chilly Bosphoran kingdom, a Hellenistic settlement in the modern-day Crimea. Macaris well aware of how Dad deals with traitors and Roman puppets, promptly commits suicide, and Mithridates' forces assume control of the Bosphoran kingdom. This is a big win for Mithridates. He has a power base again, a physical location to protect him, a base of operations to plan his next moves. But the sources tell us of his deteriorating physical and emotional condition during this time. He's racked by ailments, including his recent war wounds from the Battle of Zella, and probably nasty long-term effects from frostbite during the winter trek over the Caucasus. Mithridates decides to reach out to Pompey, hoping for a deal similar to the one that Tigranes received. He offers to pay tribute to Rome and become an ally if Rome will restore him to the throne of Pontus. He's completely out of touch with reality, isn't he? In what circumstances would the Romans yet again extend the olive branch to a nemesis who's caused so much damage to their interests, especially during the periods that the Republic itself was already in convulsions? Rome hasn't forgot the tens of thousands of Romans butchered in the Asiatic Vespers 24 years before. Pompey, proud and arrogant, rejects the terms and demands that Mithridates surrender himself in person. Mithridates, also still proud and arrogant, refuses. Our old king has three remaining options. Surrender, flee, or attack. Surrender, given his pride, is clearly out of the question. Flee? Flee where? The Bosphoran kingdom is the last real piece of earth Mithridates possesses. To flee now would mean essentially committing to a life on the run. Mithridates decides attack is his only option. His latest grand scheme involves raising a new army and marching from the Crimea to the Danube, all the while collecting the support of vast numbers of barbarian and nomadic steppe peoples, followed then by a 600-mile march from the Danube to the Alps, 
where then Mithridates would lead a collection of disaffected and Roman conquered peoples to march on Italy itself. Mithridates orders his son Pharnaces to begin military preparations. I can visualise this scene in the royal tower at Panticapium, with Mithridates sweeping his hand over maps and talking about Hannibal, the Carthaginian general who tried to march over the Alps in the Punic Wars. The remaining entourage exchanged dubious looks. And it's important that we reflect what's not being said here. Mithridates is deluded. He's in cloud cuckoo land. Nobody present, even those still loyal to him, have any faith in this plan whatsoever. The old king doesn't have a hold over anyone anymore. They all see the writing on the wall. But Mithridates can't see it yet. Pharnaces is the youngest son of Mithridates and Laodicea the Younger, and he's Mithridates' heir at this point, considering his father's propensity for murdering his own children, and in fairness, their propensity for plotting against their dear old dad. Mithridates' new military preparations, intended to be the first step in the grand plan to invade Rome, are extensive. 6,000 new elite troops, trained in Roman-style fighting, the raising of vast amounts of money through taxes and tributes, a massive fortification building program, the minting of new Mithridatic currency, the storage of huge amounts of grain and provisions, the acquisition of timber for the construction of ships and siege weapons. It's a massive undertaking, and 20 years ago, the populace would have believed in such a cause. But the wind has changed. The hardships and economic strain of such an undertaking are dismaying the population of the Bosphoran kingdom. By and large, these people have avoided most of the destruction and chaos in the Mithridatic War so far, and now Mithridates threatens to drag them into the vacuum as well. Widespread discontent is festering, with Mithridates' remaining advisors and courtesans seriously doubting how this plan will ever work. An excerpt from The Poison King perfectly captures the mood at the Mithridatic command. Quote, but his officers and soldiers, even the Roman exiles, were taken aback by the sweeping design. They began to get cold feet. The awesome scale of Mithridates' vision was intimidating. Many shrank from the idea of waging war in a distant foreign land, says Appian, against an enemy that they had not been able to overcome in their own countries. His Bosphoran subjects had enjoyed autonomy for the past 25 years. Now heavy taxes and mandatory army service seem to contradict Mithridates' core values and former promises. Some soldiers who had served him for years were becoming disillusioned. They had hoped to retire in the wealthy Bosphoran kingdom. The two or three thousand who had come over the Caucasus with their king each had a full year's pay. They hoped to make a new life. And it is worth noting that half a century separated Mithridates from his rost recruits. Some older followers perceived the king's grandiose plan as a suicidal exit strategy. Not unreasonably, they believed it was a sign of despair. It offered a way for Mithridates to end his life honourably, fighting for a noble lost cause rather than surrendering. How much better to die on the battlefield than to be strangled at the end of Pompey's triumph. End quote. This really speaks to the perception of Mithridates' mindset at this time. I mean, is this his actual goal? Not to really invade Rome, but to force a climactic confrontation with the Romans in which he's destined to die. That way he'll live forever, right? His officers and men don't feel the same. Enough young men have died for Mithridates' dreams of a new Hellenistic age. They don't want to die anymore. The straw to break the camel's back is an earthquake which causes much damage in Panticapium. To the ancients, natural disasters were the work of the gods, and the perception was that even the gods themselves had run out of belief in Mithridates. In a scene where Mithridates inspects damage to many of the fine buildings of Panticapium, the locals begin hurling curses and abuse at the king. It's his presence, 
the butcher of all those souls twenty years ago. That's caused the gods to punish the Bosphoran kingdom. Pharnaces now takes matters into his own hands. His inheritance, the entire Bosphoran kingdom, would be lost if his father's demented plan was allowed to go ahead. He plans to force his father to abdicate. Then he will be crowned ruler of the kingdom and immediately organise peace with Rome. We now have two extremely powerful and moving scenes to bring us to what we might label the climax of Act 3. The first of these scenes takes place at night and sees Mithridates confront Pharnaces about this plot. In a heated and teary emotional exchange, Mithridates for the first time ever forgives a traitor. Why? Well, Pharnaces is his favourite son, the sources say, which probably isn't difficult when you're being compared to the other children in the family who've often attempted to murder or overthrow Dad. But Arcathius' memory haunts the conversation. He was the son who died in glory and in good standing with Mithridates back in the First War. He died back near the sieges of Athens and Piraeus. Nostalgia creeps in. Weren't they better days? Doroilus was a good man too ponders Mithridates. Pharnaces isn't convinced of his father's forgiveness. He goes immediately from the tower to organise an armed coup, planning to take power the next morning. Our second heavy hitter scene takes place the next morning. Mithridates, after a night of haunting, lucid dreams, wakes to the sound of crowds outside of the castle. The coup has widespread popular support. Neither Mithridates' top commanders nor the common people want his rule to continue a day longer. Mithridates watches from the tower window as the people cheer and proclaim Pharnaces to be the new king. Mithridates has been totally abandoned. In a last attempt to escape fate, Mithridates has Pachutus deliver a message to Pharnaces offering to officially acknowledge his son as ruler and go into exile with Hypsocratia and her nomadic people. The messages go unanswered. Any remaining followers of Mithridates have vanished overnight while he was having his nightmares. Only he and Bacutus remain in the tower. The old king is lost in his thoughts as he gazes out the window of the castle tower. Pharnaces has him pinned and will without a doubt hand him over to the Romans immediately. Other than the wind howling through the tower windows, all is silent. Mithridates accepts that it is the end. With a tearful Bacutus watching, Mithridates ingests a capsule of poison. The great irony, however, is that the poison doesn't work. After a lifetime of building immunity to toxins, now it won't kill him when he needs it to the most. Mithridates then attempts to stab himself, but exhaustion and mental anguish prevent him from gathering the appropriate strength. He orders Bacutus to do the deed and spare him years of indignity and torture at the hands of the Romans. The two exchange a tearful farewell and Bacutus readies his sword above Mithridates' heart. The old king, ripping Bacutus' shoulders, tenses himself and prepares for death. The wind continues to howl through the window. Mithridates is to ascend through the afterlife. Let's pull away from our cinematic narrative and make it clear that these events, which took place 2,000 years ago, aren't exactly set in stone for us. There's an element of mystery and uncertainty here which is a cornerstone of ancient historical events. Did Bacutus kill Mithridates in the Tower? That seems to be the version of events most widely attested and believed. But then again, only Bacutus could have relayed this occurrence, and he vanishes from the historical record right after he allegedly kills Mithridates. Other sources say that Pharnaces' soldiers burst into the Tower chambers and cut the old king down. But other theories abound too including the idea that Mithridates did in fact escape the tower and lived on for years afterwards as a nomad. We'll explore these ideas a little bit nearer the end of this episode. 
And all in all, no matter what exactly the truth is, his mercy kill by Bichutis is the version I probably adhere to myself. It seems the most realistic. But what about our HBO series? It's tempting to maybe frame this as an ambiguous event. These are the things we do see. The poison failing to take effect, Mithridates failing to stab himself, Mithridates ordering Bichutis to do it, a tearful goodbye between the two men, the wind howls through the open window. Does the audience actually need to see Mithridates get knifed in the heart? Is it maybe more narratively effective not to show it? Haven't we had enough butchery? And if we don't show it, it might add more credence to the theory that Mithridates faked his death and escaped to live his final days in the wilderness with Hypsocratia. That's the dilemma that this choice presents me with, however, because personally, I do believe he died in the tower that morning, and I think it would be the most grounded, bittersweet, and true-to-form ending that this series could give the viewer. Mithridates skipping off into the sunset seems a little bit off-base for a show like this. So the cutaway from the moment of death isn't meant to perpetuate mystery or ambiguity. It's just a choice in and of itself not to show our elderly, broken protagonist get knifed in the heart. I've also made several other creative choices here, including the omittance of Mithridates' two youngest daughters' presence in the tower. I did this purely to simplify the narrative and give the final scene a more lonely, isolated tone. It's thought that by sharing poison with his daughters, Mithridates didn't leave enough to kill himself too. But this doesn't exist in our HBO series. I've made a thousand little choices like this throughout this story, so please don't confuse narrative decisions with historical inaccuracy. Certain elements and aspects of this grand epic just had to be somewhat curtailed. So what happens in the aftermath of Mithridates' death? Pharnaces sends communications to Pompey, who by now has marched as far south as Jericho, having lost the will and the interest to keep pursuing Mithridates in the north. Pharnaces requests permission to rule the Pontic Kingdom as a friend of Rome, and informs Pompey that he's embalming his father's corpse and sending it back to Pontus for burial. The news of Mithridates' death is greeted with great relief and celebration, both in Pompey's camp and back in the Senate, as commented on in The Poison King. Quote, For Rome, commented Plutarch, the death of Mithridates was like the destruction of 10,000 enemies in one fell swoop. Emphasising the greatness of Mithridates and his ultimate defeat served to aggrandise Pompey's own accomplishments. And after four decades of conflict, a certain admiration and awe surrounded this king who had eclipsed all other kings, a noble ruler who had reigned 57 years, who took over Asia and Greece, and who resisted Rome's greatest commanders and shrugged off what should have been crushing defeats. A warrior who never gave up but renewed his struggle again and again, and then, against all odds, had died an old man by his own choice in the kingdom of his fathers. End quote. But Pompey is nearly a thousand miles south of the Black Sea, and by the time he arrives in Pontus to examine the body for himself, it's in an advanced state of decomposition and can't be identified for sure. In a scene in the royal treasury in Sinope, Pompey expresses doubts that this is really Mithridates' body, but others present claim to identify certain wounds and artefacts inside the coffin that confirm it really is the old king. The manner of Mithridates' death has robbed Pompey, and Rome itself, of exacting personal revenge on him. But nonetheless, Pompey gives Mithridates a full royal funeral and buries him with his ancestors. In a wonderful scene mirroring the end of episode 3, Pompey discovers Alexander's cloak among Mithridates' possessions, echoing the venerated respect that Mithridates had paid such a vaunted possession. Pharnaces is officially recognised as the ruler of Bosphorus, but Pontus as a kingdom is dismembered and reorganised into the Roman province of Bithynia and Pontus. Pompey returns to Rome to celebrate a triumph like never before seen. He'll continue to be a driving force in Roman politics until his defeat and death in a civil war with a certain Julius Caesar in 48 BC. Hypsocratia, who vanishes from the historical record around this time too, appears not to have been in the Bosphoran kingdom at the time of the revolt and Mithridates' death. 
Historians, recognising her independent nomadic way of life, assume she was probably far north of these events. And what of Bacutus? The old Gallic mercenary simply rides off into obscurity. We now enter the final segments of our HBO series. In the last element of our triac structure, we examine the wrap-up and or aftermath of the story. But how are we going to show this now that our protagonist is gone? Well, my first instinct is to have Pompey show us. In another scene, he could read Mithridates' personal papers and memoirs, his inner monologue helping us to understand things we can't physically show. Pompey, as the one who gets the credit for finally beating Mithridates, gets a prize he doesn't know about. He becomes our narrative vehicle as the Poison King drifts to its eerie, reticent end. In Empire of the Black Sea, Dwayne W. Rolla reflects on the legacy of the Mithridatic period. Quote, For 250 years, the Mithridatic dynasty was a powerful force in the world between the time of Alexander the Great and the Roman Empire. It collapsed for the same reason that all Hellenistic dynasties did an inability to reconcile its needs with those of an ever-expanding Roman Republic, and a failure to understand the complexities of the Roman state. Tension between Pontus and Rome began at the time of Pharnaces I, and eventually overwhelmed the kingdom. Like Hannibal and Cleopatra, the Mithridatic kings could not understand the Romans, and they failed to realise the limited effect that internal dissension at Rome would have on the Republic's long-term foreign needs. Yet, Even though the kingdom of Pontus was gone by 63 BC, the descendants of the Mithridatids would continue to rule in various territories, far outlasting those of any other Hellenistic dynasty. In time, Hellenized Anatolia will be turned into a Roman province. But the Greco Persian influence will never be fully extinguished. Despite the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD, The eastern half would survive another thousand years in the form of the Byzantine Empire. So what will be the last scene of our HBO series The Poison King? Well, before we establish those waning visuals, let's examine an interesting theory. It explores the idea that Mithridates faked his death and lived out the rest of his years in the Eurasian steppe. It's very plausible, because despite all we do know about Mithridates, His life story is still incomplete when it comes to several major details. How his life ended is indicative of this, and whenever mystery shrouds the death of an ancient historical figure, theories and alternative ideas often abound. Mithridates is no different. And like I've mentioned, my opinion is that he met his end in the terror because he simply ran out of time and options. But what if things went down another way? Could the whole thing have been a massive ruse? I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that Mithridates had pulled the wall over his enemy's eyes. He had repeatedly cheated death and was adept at stealth and trickery. There are some great passages in The Poison King in which Adrienne Mayer explores this theory. Quote, Mithridates was a connoisseur of Greek myth, and theatricality and dramatic illusion were his trademarks. Ancient tragedy as well as comedy, often turned on mistaken identities, distinctive scars, birthmarks, gestures, favourite possessions. Mithridates and Pompey knew the story of how Alexander the Great's corpse had been faked. Pharnaces could have sent Pompey a double, a corpse of a man of Mithridates' age and physique and displaying a cavalryman's scarred thigh, recent sword wounds and a decomposed face. Such a deception would prevent the Romans from desecrating Mithridates' true remains if he really had died in the tower. No one expected Pompey to inter his enemy's corpse with honours in the Pontic royal tombs. According to the ancient historians, Mithridates had requested safe passage from Pantacapion to take refuge among his allies. A deception involving another's corpse could have been devised to cover Mithridates' last escape. Mayer continues in another passage. In his long life, no conspiracy ever escaped Mithridates' notice, not even the last one, plotted by Pharnaces, which he voluntarily overlooked and perished in consequence of. So ungrateful is wickedness once it is pardoned. But what if Pharnaces had actually been grateful? 
If a deception about Mithridates death and remains were to be perpetuated, it would have begun at this point, upon Mithridates' discovery of Pharnaces' conspiracy. Pharnaces knew that his betrayal warranted death. Mithridates had never spared a proven traitor's life. He was especially harsh in punishing treachery within his family. His surprising pardon of Pharnaces was the opposite of what was expected, totally out of character for the practical, ruthless, unsentimental Mithridates. The pardon guaranteed that Pharnaces would be king. What was Mithridates' true motivation? When pressed to the wall, when all seemed lost, Mithridates had a long history of successfully slipping away and eluding pursuit. It is not difficult to imagine that father and son might have negotiated a bargain. When the plot was first discovered, Mithridates still held the upper hand. The stakes were high for both men. For Pharnaces it was life or death. Only by agreeing to Mithridates' conditions could he survive to inherit his father's kingdom. Mithridates, after a half-century dealing with Romans, knew Rome would never allow him to rule in peace. His plan to invade Italy lacked crucial support, and Pharnaces was his chosen successor. If he forgave his son, Mithridates could pass the crown to his designated heir and promise to disappear completely in exchange for safe passage and a ruse to convince Pompey that he was really dead. End quote. It's a fascinating possibility, isn't it? It's almost a bittersweet consolation prize for those who don't want Mithridates to have perished in the tower. Maybe our protagonist simply rides off into the horizon. He just vanishes into the vast open steppes of Eurasia. Mithridates had experienced the nomadic lifestyle during his exile from Pontus in his youth. He had established relationships with the Scythians, Sarmatians, and other Iranian-speaking horse tribes. He even spoke some of their tongue. He was part Iranian too with his Persian heritage. What if he had a pre-arranged rendezvous with Hypsocratia? Together, they could vanish into the deserted and gargantuan territories of southern Russia or Central Asia. They would never be found, not by the Romans, not by anyone. They would hunt and remain free. So how do we see all this? Through Pompey's mind. He reads Mithridates' personal papers. He examines the terror in Panticapium. He gazes at two beautiful stallions below. He inquires about the Amazon woman who was not accounted for when Mithridates' body was found. How many times did the Romans consider Mithridates defeated or even dead? He came back every time to haunt them. As Pompey prepares to return to Rome for his triumph, he can't help but stop and look back into the tower room again. Is he really dead this time? Or is he still out there, somewhere? The scope of Mithridates' legacy is far too expansive to begin delving into here, now that our job is essentially complete. Appendix 2, which begins at page 377 in The Poison King, is an in-depth account of how Mithridates' life has been explored through literature, art, music, pop culture. If you've enjoyed the subject matter of this podcast, then The Poison King and Empire of the Black Sea are two fantastic sources to delve into further. Appendix 1 of The Poison King is also a fascinating section that examines how much Mithridates fits into what we call the mythic hero script. Adrian Mayer explores what Mithridates scores on a sort of narrative diagnostic test, asking how much he measures up to the parameters that the archetypical hero must adhere to. She also explores Mithridates from a psychological aspect trying to ascertain if what we know about his personality could be framed against specific disorders of mental and emotional health. Mithridates' life after his death is a wealth of great material, further cementing his legacy as a titanic figure in human history. One particular verse, from an 1896 poem by A. E. Hausman, has become particularly famous. Quote, There was a king reigned in the east, with poison meat and poison drink, he gathered all the springs to birth from the many venomed earth. First a little, thence to more, he sampled all her killing store, 
An easy, smiling season sound, sate the king when healths went round. They put arsenic in his meat, and stared aghast to watch him eat. They poured strychnine in his cup, and shook to see him drink it up. They shook, they stared as whites their shirt, tell it was their poison hurt. I tell the tale that I heard told. Mithridates, he died old. End quote. There's such defiance in those words. No matter the exact manner of his death, Mithridates did die old, unlike many of his enemies and contemporaries. To live to his estimated age of around 70, in the cutthroat world of ancient Hellenistic state-building and warfare, was quite an achievement. But beyond the literal sense of growing old, Mithridates was, and remains, one of the greatest enemies that the most powerful ancient state on earth ever had. He remains a symbol of the old world, before the rise of Christianity and the medieval genesis of the modern states we recognise today. The past, they say, is an alien planet. They do things a little differently there. Mithridates' planet is one quite strange to us, as ours would be to him, but I'd like to think Mithridates would be somewhat impressed that on our strange planet, in the year 2021, his name is still remembered and his deeds are still spoken of. So we never did settle on what was the very final scene of this show. How about Pompey at his glorious triumph in Rome? A golden chariot carries him past throngs of cheering and very grateful Romans. He saved Rome from the sacking of a barbarian warlord. With Alexander the Great's purple cloak now draped around his shoulders, Pompey is poised to become the master of Rome. But in the midst of his glory, just for a moment, his face hardens and his eyes stare forward. Is he still out there? At the very beginning of this podcast, You heard a quote from a 1673 interpretation of the Greek tragedy Mithridate. I thought it would be more effective not to translate it for you until you had heard the entire Mithridatic saga. The translation is as follows. Quote, May the Romans, hard pressed from one end of the world to the other, be unsure where you will be and find you everywhere. End quote. Mithridates has long since transcended from a mortal being into the realm of eternal timelessness. He was the dying beacon of the waning old world, one of the last great ancient rulers, before human history moved on and began to resemble the world that you and I are much more familiar with. Mithridates, King of Pontus, the Great, He's etched into our collective sense of romance, nostalgia, and immortality. Whether he did live on for years more in the wilderness of the steppe, or whether he did indeed perish on that cold morning in the terror in Panticapium, Mithridates, in a metaphysical sense, is still alive and present in the conscious memories of any history lover today. Mithridates still lives on, 2,084 years after the great king departed this mortal world. So this is the end of our podcast series on Mithridates and the trilogy of wars he fought against Rome. This has been my first podcasting venture and I want to thank you for spending the time to listen to it. It took me many months of preparation, writing, recording and editing this so I really do appreciate your listenership and your patience. And who knows, if this podcast takes off, I will certainly start a new series. The HMPO department of HBO will be given the go-ahead to develop a new show about another batshit insane historical event. So until then, thank you so much for listening, and I hope to see you again in the future. To subscribe to this podcast, 
just search for the Historical Motion Picture Organization on whatever platform you use, and hopefully you'll find me there. If you want to follow the podcast on social media, you can find me on Twitter by searching at HMPO Podcast, or on Instagram with the handle HMPO underscore podcast. You can find the show on YouTube by searching HMPO Podcast, and you can contact me directly by email at hmpo.podcast at gmail.com. Growing a podcast from humble beginnings is a very difficult thing to do, so if you can support the HMPO in any way, it would mean a lot to me. You can do this by following me on social media, you can share the podcast with even one other person, and you can subscribe to me and give me a good rating on whatever platform you listen on. I will really appreciate it. So thank you for listening, thank you for your support, and I hope you'll join me again soon in the ancient past.